So good day, friends. This is Dr. Bob Hamilton, and you have tuned in today to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Before we begin the show, I want to say thank you for tuning in. It means so, so much to me. Uh, the fact that you are there keeps me going. If you're not there, then I will I will shut it down and think think of something else to do. But I I love this show. I'm enjoying it, and I'm learning. I'm meeting so so many amazing people. Um, I'm actually having a good time. I'm reading a lot of books, as you might imagine. So thank you for tuning in. You keep me going. Uh, if you like what you hear, share it with your friends. Share it with your family. We're building an audience, not for Bob Hamilton, Dr. Bob, but for the people we bring on the show. Because the people we br I bring on the show on a weekly basis are amazing people. And today I have the great privilege of welcoming one of those amazing people. His name is Fred Joyle. And he has written a book called Super Bold, From Underconfident to Charismatic in 90 Days. There aren't too many things you can do in 90 days, but he can make you uh, a bolder person if you follow his prescription. Um, so, uh, Fred, thank you for joining us, joining us today on the Hamilton Review. Bob, uh, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, I'm gonna we're gonna. Fred, I'm going to have you tell your story in a second here, but let me just say, let me just read a little bit about who Fred Joyle is. He's an author, a speaker, entrepreneur, a business advisor. He has had a, a career in advertising and marketing. He is the co-founder of the most successful dentist referral service in the country. It is called 1-800-DENTIST, D-E-N-T-I-S-T. -E if you're looking for a dentist, I presume that is still... Act, act in action. Is that correct, uh, Fred? Yes, yes. It's not a business I own anymore, but it still operates. Still out there. Okay. He's written two books on marketing, dabbling in stand-up comedy and improv comedy, acted in bad movies, excellent TV commercials, and has visited over 44 countries in the world. Is it still 44 or is that an old number? Are you, are you up to a higher I'm a, number? Uh, you know, COVID really slowed me down. So I'm I'm about to start dialing it up again. I've got two more lined up to get it to 44. Okay, so you're still, it's still 44. Yes. That's amazing. Uh, we may get back to that because I'm curious to know where you've been. Uh, he has an honorary doctorate of arts degree from University of Rhode Island. He... Um, ha he <laughs> He once beat Richard Branson, uh, Sir Richard Branson, in chess. A uh, great story, by the way. He's an avid cyclist, a below-average tennis player, and an even worse golfer. Well, Fred, you may be, you're maybe the one guy I like to play golf with. Uh, I don't play golf very much, but maybe you're the one guy I'll call to play golf with. So um, I'm going to stop talking and turn the microphone over to you. And first of all, uh, before we get too deep into this, into your book, which I want to talk about, uh, tell us a little bit about who Fred Joel is. Yeah, so I grew up in a small town uh, in Rhode Island, and uh, and my, my primary experience was boredom in my my youth, and uh, and so. I, I, but what happened really is I was also very shy growing up. And, uh, but I eventually, I got out to college. I started to meet more interesting people. But then the real thing that happened was I got to Los Angeles. And I said, oh, this is, this is where I want to be. And if you're lucky in life, you find out that place, that locus in your life where you belong, where that resonates with you. Uh, and that was Los Angeles for me. I, we, I slept on some guy's floor for two weeks in Venice Beach. And uh, I had to go back and finish college, but then I was I was back right away. And it, it Los Angeles was very good to me. I, I had a bunch of friends there. Um, and but the real thing that happened for me was I found the advertising business because I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I I kept missing opportunities because I wasn't taking chances, I wasn't taking risks, I wasn't pushing myself. Um, and then suddenly I, I found the ad business and I said, this is what I want to do. These are my people. 
this I could do this because I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do with my life. What could I possibly do, you know, for a, a, a career until I discovered that. And so uh, I managed to get myself a job as a junior copywriter. It took me six months and that was the beginning of it. And then I eventually decided I wanted my own advertising business and started 1-800-DENTIST with a good friend of mine. And we didn't know what the heck we were doing, but it was the boldest move in my life because I said, I, I'm going to try to create a business because we had to invent every aspect of it. There was no template for it whatsoever. And we just, it was, you know, we call it the most expensive MBA ever. Uh, because we kept, kept making hundred thousand dollar mistakes. Um, wow. and, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's like, as long as you make survivable mistakes and figure and learn from them, you're, you're going to be okay. And that, that was us. And we became the largest referral service in the country. Um, and along with that, I started doing the commercials and then I also said, look, I'm, I've always wanted to do stand-up comedy, but I was too afraid to do it. I was too afraid of how badly it was going to go or that I would be embarrassed or ashamed or, or humiliated. And I had a good friend who was a comic, did it for a living. And he said, I know you want to do this. He says, everything you think is true about this uh, is not true. And he says, and you won't figure that out until you get on stage and you'll find out what you really need to be scared of. Uh, and he was absolutely right. Uh, and so... Um, and I did that. I studied with the Groundlings for several years, improv comedy, which really taught me so much about how to communicate and trust myself. Then I started a speaking career based on, you know, to the dental industry based on, on marketing. And I just kept expanding my comfort zone. And then I realized I had become a bold person and I was no longer stacking regrets because I, when I was younger, that's all I seemed to do was have regrets over what I should have done, should have said, should have tried. And I hesitated and would miss these opportunities. And yeah. it, I, I, it made me angry after a while because I said, like, why are bold people this way? Why doesn't rejection bother them? Um, and I figured it out. And I, and, and I just kept being rewarded for being bolder even though it wasn't maybe even chasing the thing I wanted, I learned to just trust that something interesting was going to happen. Something better was going to come out of it. And I thought, I want to really help people understand how I did this and how they could do it way faster because it took me decades. Uh, and so, so that's, that's so the, where the book me, came me, from. Yeah, so. let, me, let me back up a tiny bit here because I, I want to, you're, you're jumping into your book and, I, and I, I really want to talk about your book. But when you were a kid, you said that you, you were bored. Is that what, do you, and, and I will tell you that when I was a kid, I was bored. I was, I was bored at times as well. Um, and, I, and I happen to, uh, I embrace boredom. I think boredom is actually one of the things that is one of the, even though we hate it, per, you know, as a kid or anybody, when you're bored, boredom is a very uncomfortable feeling. And I hate it personally, but I, but I love it as well. Tell us a little bit about your boredom and what did you do when you were bored? What happened is I developed this appetite for reading. That uh, and, you know, and it, it started a Marvel comics, but then it expanded into uh, you know I went to a very good high school that uh, it was an all boys high school, so I didn't have distractions of girls and and actually learned something. Uh, but they were very rigorous, particularly with language skills, and I really started to understand literature and writing, which of course led right into the advertising career. Uh, sure. But that was how I treated boredom is I would just find a book. I would be reading all the time. Uh, and, and but I also, because of it, didn't develop a lot of social skills because I was I was also hiding in the books. Yeah. So you talk about you when you were a kid, you were shy. What, what did that look like? Uh, what kind of a kid would you be if I was I say if I was in 10th grade with you? What kind of kid were you? I would be uh, 
quiet. I wouldn't introduce myself to people. Uh, I wouldn't initiate conversations. I would let people ask me questions about myself and, and be interested in me. And I didn't know how to be interested in other people. And, and I just, you know, there were people who brought me out of my shell. And once I got out of my shell, I wasn't, I didn't behave shyly with them. And that's a point I try to make to people is like, you are not shy. You behave in a certain way, in a shy way at certain times. You're not shy yeah. at Thanksgiving dinner. You're not shy with your best friend. You're shy when you're trying to meet somebody that you really want to meet and you don't feel worthy to meet them. So you tell yourself they don't want to meet you. And so you stop yourself, you hesitate. And, yeah. and then you say, well, I don't want to have fun because I don't want to dance because people might laugh at me. And then other people are dancing badly and you're, you're criticizing them, but they're having a good time. And so, uh, you know, it's like the, I was related to the person in the comedy club who's sitting there with his arms folded, not laughing. And the person next to him is laughing her head off. And I, and I just said, who's having a better time here? The guy who's judging everything, whether it's funny or not, or the person who's laughing for two hours because she's not worried about letting it out. Whereas, yeah. you know, and I was that guy. I was the critic. Uh, that was my safe harbor is I get to criticize everybody instead of trying things and failing. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I, I, I find it almost ironic that here you are as a, as a kid in high school, um, <clears throat> shy or not, maybe not taking that, that initiative to re reach out and do things. Did you, you, you felt that hesitation is that, or did, was it, did you sense that you were, you were holding yourself in? Is that why you were shy? Yeah, there's what happens is you somewhere in, in your youth or childhood, and it could have happened a few times or several times happen or happen a lot, is that somebody pushed you too far out of your discomfort zone. That would have my mom. She was always trying to make me do bold stuff. Oh, call so and so. Go do this. Go do that. Go meet them. Go. And I would be like, I, I wasn't ready for that. I didn't have any preparation to get yeah. me there. I hadn't yeah. worked my way up. She was always trying to make quantum leaps in my my extroversion. And it and and also I was a I was a smaller kid. I skipped the second grade. So I was always younger and smaller all the way through high school. And I wore glasses and stuff like that. And and and, it, and all of these things inhibited me, made me made me feel like I didn't belong or wasn't worthy or interesting or and and people make fun of you you know you know you grow up with bullies and stuff like that and it it affects you and it, and you yeah. and you go go into a, a your shell you go into a safe place where you go I'm not going to let people hurt me anymore um, and bold people don't let that they don't they don't care what other people think they don't they yeah. have like a half a dozen people whose opinions matter to them. And they don't worry about anybody else. They go like their opinion to me is none of my business. Let them think whatever they want. I got so stuff that, that to is do. A, I got dreams a, to chase. Yeah, that is a when you come to that point in your life, it, it is a liberating point. I, I find it interesting, though. It's very ironic that you, the shy kid, maybe in in junior high and high school, suddenly are out there doing comedy. Because when I look at comedians, they seem to be extremely vulnerable people. They're up there. And sometimes they they tell the joke and the joke, it goes over like a lead balloon, as they say. And, uh, you know, there, I mean, um, obviously, when that happens, you've, you uh, well, listen, let me ask you, Fred, uh, you've told jokes from a stage to a group of people and nobody laughs. How do you feel when that happens? Well, what my I had a good coach, which is the other thing is like if you have somebody who who gives you insight into things, it gives yeah. you the right perspective. It's just like we're talking about now. If you can get rid of the judgment of other people, you can get way farther in life. Uh, yeah. But he said, "You're funny. Sometimes the joke isn't. Yeah. Don't worry about that. Keep yes. moving." Never blame the audience for not laughing. This was like 
really valuable information. So I would, he said, like, just dismiss it. Get, like, say something like, this was so funny to me in the shower this morning. I don't understand why you're not getting it. And, and then they laugh at that. Uh, <laughs> and, and, but yeah. as long as you don't blame them, as long as you don't decide to get nervous, he said, they say, he says, because nobody wants to watch somebody nervous on stage. You, yes. You've, you've put yourself on stage. That's your choice. They're looking at you to make them laugh. If you don't, that's not their problem. That's your problem. You need to be funnier or the joke needs to be better. And he said, but. Either way, whether you bomb or you kill, it's over. And you're all you're thinking about is the next set. And it was a so great, I, such I do, a liberating thing, you know? The the you do see people who speak and you you can tell that they're like really nervous. And I don't think that there's anything more unnerving for a person in the audience to feel than that nervousness with them because it is a uh, a you almost can't hide it uh you can't hide that nervousness and people kind of go they cringe right they 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 feel yeah. it immediately in you and and the idea that when you get out there and say hey you know what uh i kind of don't care what people think that is then you're not you're you're not you're, you're, your nervousness kind of dissolves um that's a powerful uh, that's actually another big victory so you wrote this book. You uh, you learned that bold people do things, and um, I, I like what you write. And I'm gonna kind of we're gonna get to your book now because I think your book is something we want to really kind of dive into. The first couple of words of your book are this: uh, boldness is a superpower. I love that. It's a superpower. What do I mean that by this? You ask. I mean compared to average human beings. Bold individuals seize life in remarkable, almost unbelievable ways. They run for president. They succeed in business, in careers, in love. They are generally have a good time. Bold people walk up to supermodels and ask them to dance. Uh, they dance. They stand in front of audiences and tell jokes, not even minding when people don't laugh. They sing karaoke badly and sober every weekend. They sit in front at the front of a room and ask questions. They start companies. They climb under the velvet ropes to meet a rock star or sneak into a nightclub. Or maybe they refuse to move to the back of the bus like Rosa Parks. Or they're a politician who decides he can end slavery or the Cold War. Um, you know, you're right. When you think about these individuals out there, there's something in them that propelled them to do something very unique. And I, I think that boldness is the, is the word. That is the word. Tell us a little bit about uh, why we need boldness. To me, the, the biggest reason is that life is short. It goes by fast and you kind of don't realize it. You, especially younger, you feel like you've got so many decades ahead of you. But they start to go by in a blink. Uh, and it's it's too short to let other people decide what you're capable of. It, yeah. It's too short to live other people's dreams, and and it's it's too short to feel unworthy and judge yourself and be the one stopping you. This is what bold people never do. They never stop themselves. They let somebody else try. And that's that's a big difference because yeah. it's amazing what you can achieve if you don't stop yourself. Nobody stops you as much as you do because you go, oh, this is going to be embarrassing. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be hurt. I'm going to be humiliated. I'm going to fail. Oh, no. Yeah. But that's how you learn to walk, to talk, to sing, to dance, to drive a car. Fail, 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 fail. That's how we that's how human beings learn. And, yeah. and so at a certain point, we go like, I don't want to fail anymore because, you know, we've got this F, you know, this terrible thing that we put out there. Oh, you're a, it, you failed that class. I've failed classes where I learned the most in 
because I didn't care what the grade was. I the, the the teacher was my employee at that point in my mind. I was in college and I went, I'm here to learn what I want to learn from him. And if he gives me a D, I don't care. And yeah. that's and so like I, I early on I was starting to dismiss this fear of failure thing because it 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 stops you dead in your tracks. Whereas bold people go like I'm gonna I'm gonna fail upwards. I, failure is failure is where I'm getting my information. I'm gonna walk up to that woman and ask her to dance, and she's gonna not talk to me. Uh, and I'm gonna say, wow, I probably should have prepared something a little more interesting, uh, and and then try it again. Whereas other yeah. people go, well, I'm never going to do that again. That felt terrible. And well, I'll tell you, so, the, the, people, the, yeah. the people out there who do win in life usually have failed miserably. And I, I'm thinking about, you know, you, in your comments here, you know, you, you're bold enough to, con to think that you can end slavery. I mean, we're talking about Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln, um, was a miserable failure. He failed multiple times. In uh, in in uh, he ran for I think he ran for Congress. I mean, like multiple times. I mean, right until all of a sudden he he won, and then all of a sudden he's the president. So you look at these people, and they they just there's something burning in their heart that keeps them moving, moving, moving. But failure is a thing that I, I will tell you personally. I. Um, I, I have the same kind of fear I think that most people have. I have a fear of failure. And, and it's one of these things that um, it, it has has terrified me personally. Uh, even when I went into my own practice many years ago, um, I would say, you know, people would say, well, you're Bob, you're starting your own practice. And I said, yeah, I am. And I said, I hope it works. And I would kind of backtrack and say, you know, I I'm 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 going to give it a try and I'm going to see how it goes and if it doesn't work I'll go get another job and everything and finally my wife looked at me and she said never say that again and I go what and she goes never say if it doesn't work and I and I said okay and she said because you're not going to fail and you and you need to get over that and and to my and I will tell you to my wife's uh, to her eternal credit and I will always give her credit for this, she kind of slapped me upside the head and said, knock it off. Stop, stop saying that. And I did. And I, and I, and I did fail. I'm still here. I'm <laughs> still in practice, you know, 25 plus years later. And um, I will tell you though, that, you know, sometimes you need that, that slap on the, uh, on, on the, uh, on the hand to kind of, you know, keep you from saying stupid things. I love this quote, uh, which you put in your book. When I let go of who I am, I discover who I might become. That was Lao Tzu um, who wrote that. And I, and I think that there is that sense of letting go because when you are in front of a group of people, obviously you're kind of putting yourself in harm's way. Is that how you look at it, Fred? Yeah, and within that, and again, I, all of this about what we're talking about about boldness i wish i knew the stuff in my book at 15 at 16 or even at 20 or 25 the, the younger you learn it the younger you learn to to let those things go let judgment of other people go and let go of your self-definition that's a lot of what lao tzu is saying it's like when i let go of, of who i am I discover who I can become yeah. because we trap ourselves. Oh, and we, and we trap ourselves with all the negative stuff. Oh, I'm not good at math. Oh, I, I'm, I'm not a good dancer. People don't find me interesting right away. The list goes on. And I, in my book, I actually say like, write the, when you hear yourself say this, write it down and say, is that true? Or is that just something I told myself? Yep. Yeah, so, and most of the time, it's a trap. Yep, it is a trap. So listen, you, you have people listening to you right now who are parents of children who are shy. Uh, maybe a little bit like you when you were a kid. Um, you have a you have what you call the pride method. And um, maybe what you can do is, would you mind walking? Because uh, I think this would be the, your 
your recommendation to these families in terms of how to guide a a, a child? Because my my show, by the way, is a my my subtitle is my my show is where kids and culture collide. And uh, there are listen all the people who listen to my show love their children. They want the best for their kids, and they may have a kid who's a little bit on the shyer side. I'm going to let you take it from here. What, how would you, uh, what kind of instruction would you give these parents? So uh, I, I'm going to focus on one aspect of the pride method more than others, but the, there's a five-step uh, method based on that acronym. Ac yeah, not an acronym. Ac uh, uh, abbreviation. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes. Uh, an abbreviation. <laughs> abbreviation with letters. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and and that's see, and that's another thing. We're going to stop there because the some people, when that happens, they would be embarrassed and they would get tongue tied. I make a mistake like that on stage. I just ask for help from the audience. You know, like wait a minute, somebody, what's the word? Somebody's dying to yell it out for you. Um, mm -hmm. And and they go and they look at me and they go, wow, that didn't bother him at all. It's like, yeah, I chose not to be embarrassed. Embarrassment's a choice. Amazing. Feeling rejected is a choice. Yeah, all of those things. So so I, I'm sidetracking here, but the pride method preparation is the first step. If you're gonna if you're going into a new situation, prepare what you're gonna say. If you're gonna talk to a stranger, prepare a compliment for that stranger. And then, and then relax yourself. That's the R. You can relax yourself very easily just using your breath and controlling your physiology. I, catch yourself tensing up and shake it off. Take three deep breaths. When I, before I go on stage, I'll take three deep breaths. But it's a big stage and I'm saying like, wow, that's 5,000 people. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I want to turn the anxiety into energy. And three breaths, deep breaths will do that. And you, you can calm yourself. And there's, there's more I talk about in the book. There's other techniques that are super simple. Then insights is the I. And we talked about some of them. Is, you know, when you, you know, when you're worrying about what other people think, people are not thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. And that's what we're all, oh, they're thinking about me. It's like, yeah, they think about me for about three seconds. And they're making judgments about you and they're totally inaccurate. You're doing the same thing. When you realize if I'm doing that and I'm wrong and I'm, when I do that all the time, I meet people and I've got a judgment about them. I'm like that guy should never wear those glasses. That guy should cut that hair. That's a stupid tattoo. It's like I have all of it. Then I meet them and I find them fascinating. Everybody's interesting in some way and everybody's different than you think they are about 95% of the time with your so first true. judgment. Yeah. So, so true. I just, I've learned to like, so everybody's doing that to me too. So why would I worry about it? They're wrong. They're, there's 95% chance of them judging me wrong. So why would I worry about it? And that's like, so that's like a key insight. If you, you just understand that and there's four or five things that, that are about your hesitation and your shyness. And, you know, it's an insight to, to really say, you know, I'm stopping myself. I'm I, I, my, I'm afraid of failing because of because I want it so badly. That's what stops people is they like if I fail at that, then it's going to be too painful. So they guarantee the failure by not trying. And the greatest insight of all, the transformational insight, is the when you reach that point where trying and failing feels way better than not trying. When trying and failing feels better than not trying because you took a shot, because it doesn't, what gnaws at you later in life are all the things you didn't try. Mm. The things yeah. you tried and bungled, you can't even remember them and nobody else remembers them either. Yeah, no, I, and if, I and if you about, did bungle them, you went like, yeah, but I, I mean, I bungled things and I look back and I go, thank God I bungled that because this direct, this window opened for me that I would have never gotten to. Sure. Yeah, and no, I, 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 I think that there. 
I think that uh, people are held back by a lot of things. And um, uh, when you, th those are the regrets you have. I mean, usually the regrets you have are things like, why didn't I buy that property next door that I could have bought, but I decided not to buy it because I was afraid I wouldn't be able to pay for it or something. And you kind of go, dang, that's worth about a million, you know, a couple million dollars more than I could, I would, I, I, you know, when I had it. Okay, so there, there are a lot of regrets we can have in life, but a lot of them are is the fact that we, we don't act. Um, obviously, there are times we have regrets for things we do do, as well. Uh, there are things we do that are really stupid, but uh, this is not what we're talking about right now. You talk about dosage, so that you, you've talked about preparation, relaxing. Relaxation, insight, dosage. What does that mean? Dosage is, is so important because remember I said early on in life, something you overdose on something that made you feel embarrassed or unworthy or hurt. And, uh, and you got pushed too far into your discomfort zone. Yeah. When you're trying to build your boldness muscle, because boldness builds just like a muscle. Boldness is a life skill. It is not a personality trait. A lot of people think it's a personality trait. It trait. It's a skill you learn, and it builds just like a muscle. It builds gradually and steadily. You expand By the way, your comfort I, I, zone. Fred, I I love I love that concept. Okay, say say that again. Boldness is something you learn. Boldness builds like a muscle. It is a life skill, not a personality trait. If you understand one thing, if you come away from one thing with this podcast, understand that. Realize that that is the truth, that anyone can build their boldness and they can do it faster than they ever imagined possible. Anyone. And, and if you have children, a lot of times what you're doing is you're overdosing them because you don't want them to miss opportunities. You know, I was watching a friend of mine and she was like, you know, she has a 16 year old son and, and these three girls were walking by him, you know, and, and said, oh, hey, you're cute. One of the girls said, and he said nothing. And his mother proceeded to explain to him for the next 15 minutes, all the things he should have said. Well, guess what? That's an overdose. What you need yes. to do is just get him to say hi. And if hi is too much, you get them to smile. Whatever, yeah. every, we're, we're all at our own level working our way up. And we all have, you know, <laughs> I'm going to give you the medical term. You titrate to tolerance. There we go. That's the word. Yeah. You titrate. Yeah. yeah. And, and so wherever that person is, wherever that kid is, it, you're just going to you're going to give them that next baby step so yep. that they and, and that they can repeat that if if they're afraid to talk to strangers you don't say honey you need to start talking to strangers you need to start asking people questions you need to and they then they got they got a, the whole lesson on how to become a total extrovert what they need to say is from now on, every time we're in a restaurant, you're just going to look the waiter in the eye when you order. And then you're going to pay the, then you work it up. Then you're going to say hi. Then you're going to ask him his name. And all of a sudden, the, the child's comfort zone gets a little bigger and a little bigger. Be patient. And what's going to happen is she's going to get bolder and bolder and bolder until you yeah. can't stop her. I love she's getting a taste for it. She's going to get, there's a feedback loop that happens when you are bold because unexpectedly wonderful things start to happen. And you yep. start to trust that something unexpected is going to happen. You say, I'm going to go in. I don't even know what's going to happen. Let's just see. And it could go great or it could go badly. And you say, well, nothing interesting happened at all. Maybe so what? It's a yeah. great thing to say, so what? Oh, That's right. they're all, they're, nobody laughed at that joke. So what? Everybody thought I had the dumbest looking shirt on ever. So what? Right. That's right. Release yourself from it. So the, the last part of your 
little uh, acronym here of PRIDE, uh, is everyday action. And I guess that anything, you know, you're talking about boldness is a strength. It is something that you develop. I guess that you got to do this every day. And, and, but anything you want to get to that's important, get to it every day. Yeah. Even if it's for two minutes or one minute or five, uh, half an hour, they say you can learn to play a musical instrument much more click, quickly in 10 minutes a day than if you practice two hours for two days each day on weekends. It's a fascinating thing. But two things happen when you work on stuff, whatever it is, but obviously working on your boldness, because I got a bunch of exercises in the book that build your boldness muscle gradually is two things happen. The first thing is your brain says, oh, this is what we are. We are somebody who speaks up, who says hi, who meets people. We are somebody who exercises. We are somebody who plays guitar because you do it every day. Yep. If you don't do it every day, your brain is lazy. Your brain is 2% of your body weight and burning 20% of your calories. It's looking for a way to save calories. It's trying to be lazy. It's trying to shut as many things off as possible. So if you just, if you're a weekend warrior and you do it when you feel like it, your brain says, oh, I'm a dabbler. I'm not a writer. I'm not a singer. I'm not a guitar player. Uh, I'm not a comedian. Uh, I don't sing karaoke. I don't exercise. I dabble in that. And so, but the other thing that happens is when you do something every day, six months go by and you've all of a sudden, you've covered an amazing amount of ground. I, I ask people, I say, how often would you work out if you worked out when you felt like it? Two days a year? So it, that's all, everything, anybody who's gotten anywhere has figured out how to do things when they don't feel like doing them. So true. It's just, I, so I true. think I just heard Michael Phelps say exactly that when he's talking about an Olympic athlete. He says, you don't think there were times when I didn't want to get out of bed? Everybody has days where they don't want to get out of bed. Anybody who tells you that, that they never feel that way, it's just lying. Lying. No, I, no, I, I was just... But, I was, I was just watching the Olympics, uh, some of these Olympic highlights, and looking at these amazing athletes and, and thinking they just didn't wake up one day and jump in the pool and go to, the, go to Paris. These guys were, have been doing this year after year, disciplining themselves, uh, and, it's, and it's an everyday, pretty much an everyday process if you want to reach that kind of level of, of, of uh expertise and accomplishment that's for sure um okay well and so, you know and that that's what i talked about is this this is the paradox is life is short and yet it's a long game if you want to get somewhere so you it's all about what you do every day is how you you stack these things that get you closer and closer to whatever your dreams are and then you realize wow i i need bigger dreams I, yep. I got farther than I thought because you got to it. You got to it and you did it. Well, listen, um, Fred, I'm looking at our time and I, and this, this interview went by really quickly because I am fascinated, first of all, by you personally and your, who you are and where you were in terms of if you were a shy kid, uh, I, I, I'm not seeing it, but anyway, that's, that's good. <laughs> And I and friends, those of you who are listening, the name of the book is called Super Bold. It is the subtitle is From Underconfident to Charismatic in 90 Days. Um, this is a phenomenal idea, friends. And this is uh, something that we all need to hear that boldness is something that we all need to have because we all need to be those people who are willing to. Uh, get out there and speak up and do the things that we're called to do because I think that we all have a, a wonderful calling on our life. But if you don't exercise and you don't get out there and do it, you lose you lose it. And um, that is true, Fred. I think that the you know the regrets that we have are things that we did not do um, more than the things we did do. So 
uh, I want to first of all say congratulations for writing this amazing book, number one. And I wish you the very uh, best success. How can people find you, uh, Fred? Very easy. Fredjoyle.com. That's J-O-Y-A-L. And of course, the, the books are on Amazon in uh, hardcover, Kindle, and Audible. And it's me reading the, the Audible. Uh, and uh, of course, I, I do lectures. So if you're interested in me speaking to your, your teams or your school, I love talking to to college kids and even high school kids about this because like I said it's what I wish I knew then some of my most gratifying lectures are to high school classes and uh, but uh, you can find out more about that see some of my lectures also on uh, my website so that's that's so how you find this, out more this is good friends if you have access to uh, groups of kid people who need to hear this message, I would encourage you to find uh, Fred Joyle. And uh, Fred, I'm going to I'm going to leave it there. Uh, again, the name of the book is Super Bold uh, by Fred Joyle. J-O-Y-A-L is how you spell his last name. And I want to say thank you. You're a busy guy. I really appreciate the fact that you came on. Uh, the Hamilton podcast today, Hamilton Review podcast. So thank you, Fred. Best best wishes to you. Thank you, Bob. I, I really enjoyed being on. I appreciate it. Great, great conversation. And friends, to those listening, thank you for tuning in today to the Hamilton Review. Tune in next week as well and pass it on to your friends. Until then, be well. Bye-bye. You have been listening to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your day. Tune in again next week on Apple Podcasts. Rate and comment and tell a friend.